really does it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> welcome back, honors. Scared the bejesus out of my child. This is just for the girls. This is herstory class now. How do you like that? <laughs> Whatever. You can get out. Who run the world? Okay, so it's a pleasure to know how hard you're working. Uh, because this is an insane situation that you have adapted to so well. I'm very proud of you. You should be proud of yourselves because this is basically what college is. Sometimes your professor just sounds like might as well be a computer. I don't know. Well, you're lucky that Mr. Terry is so animated, but you're doing it. You're making it happen. You're going to close out the year. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to look great for you because you're doing all your work and making it happen. Um, I just want to pop in and say, hey, what's up? Hello with Joe. And a question for you. I am very curious, as you know, many of you know, I'm very much into food. <laughs> Saw it! What do you think about hot dogs? Are they a sandwich? Or are they not a sandwich? I need to know. And the best argument, not the longest argument, the best argument, most well-supported argument, will get extra credit points. I have already made this, gotten this approved by Mr. Derry. Would you leave her alone? Demerits. This is why women need to go to school by themselves so they don't get bothered <laughs> by hooligans like you. Yeah, see, she even finds it funny. Under how many characters? Um, characters? I don't know. Maybe like under a hundred words. A hundred words? That's super long. That's totally fine. Okay, fine. It has to be under 79 words. Okay, fine. Great. Okay, cool. Uh, actually, let's make it 76 words, and you get an extra bonus point if you can guess why I chose the number 76. In fact, <laughs> I just oh, nailed uh, it in the face. Um, ow. Uh -oh. <laughs> have a wonderful day oh, and a wonderful God. lesson. It's going to be great, and I'll leave it to him now. <laughs> oh, can I have my yeah, I know. She hit me in the face. Can you I, bite her. Can bite I her good. But No. You can't have your coffee, you big meanie. Yeah, Rufio, you give me that ball, big boy. Oh, yeah, good boy. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, good boy. All right, we'll, we'll talk later. All right, so anyway, I know. We'll debrief. Don't worry. We'll pack her stuff up for her. <laughs> All right, welcome back, girls. All right, good to see you again. Uh, like uh, to reiterate what the wife was saying, or Miss... Should I call you Mrs. Terry, I guess? I guess. Yeah. To reiterate what Mrs. Terry was saying, uh, yeah, is a hot dog a sandwich? I don't know. Best comment gets extra credit. Um, she is going to be the one judging them, so got to like play to her aspects a little bit, right? Um, but let's go ahead and get into it. This is a weekend flip during our online course, so I don't want to take up too, too, too much of your time. Now, what we can go ahead and do, though, speaking of, just to be safe, let's go ahead and set a timer real fast, just to make sure we're not going too far over. Stuff like that. So what we're getting into now is we're going to be... Le oh, no, boo-boo. Hello. Uh, so, sorry. Ricky is on the bed. Um, we are going to be getting into some stuff outside of Europe now. What we're moving into now is we're moving into the effects of the Napoleonic takeover of Europe. And mainly its effects on an international scale, right? We're going into the ideas of how did Napoleon's takeover of Europe affect the colonial holdings of a lot of these superpowers that existed in Europe during this time period? How did it affect Spain? How did it affect Great Britain? How did it affect uh, oh, France's colonial holdings during their revolution? What is going to be the play here? So let's keep going, though, because it's going to basically turn the Western Hemisphere of the world from this into this. So as you can see, we're going to go from large vice royalties and a viceroy or a vice royalty is a government ran by a viceroy usually uh acquiesced from Spain and then as you can see over here, now we're going to get broken up into a lot of these different countries, which plays heavily into some different ideas, particularly the one of like it's a big debate, right? Because I know some of you right now are asking yourself well, Mr. Terry, when we were talking about Egypt and stuff, we talked about other countries taking over things. And I also remember when I was younger and I was in school, we talked about imperialism. But well, what's the real difference between imperialism and colonialism? Well, getting into it a little bit, imperialism is going to be the new thing we're going to start talking about at the end of this unit. I'm just bringing up these isms so you don't get confused. 
Uh, this is kind of like a table of contents debate discussion. So basically, imperialism, which you can put in quotes or in parentheses somewhere, is like what starts to occur in the 19th century or the 1800s, which is going to be a policy of extending a country's power and influence through military, political, or economic forces and exploiting a country or another group of people economically, right? So basically, it's a policy of extending a country, right? Let's say, hypothetically, I'm saying Terriopolis goes and take o takes over Sylvester Island, and I'm extending my control economically to take over where she is from. That's my wife's maiden name, just a heads up. And then versus colonialism, which was the thing up until this point from the 1400s, the 1500s, the era of Columbus, which is the policy of acquiring full physical control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it, exploiting it economically. And so some of y'all are immediately like, oh, well, this is both exploiting it economically? I'm super, super confused. Well, let's go ahead and cut over. We actually have a, uh, a professor in the house that's with us right now, and he's going to take two seconds to go ahead and explain to you the major differences between imperialism and colonialism. Thank you, Dr. Rufio. Very, very nice. He's going to be at, uh, you know, he's getting his full tenure soon at like UNO and things like that. But as you can see, what he was referring to is imperialism is the advanced way, the 1800s method of taking over foreign bodies. Usually Europe is going to do this to Asia and Africa during the 1800s, and they're going to use economics, military, or political power to kind of take over an area without physically being there. Colonialism, on the other hand, is when you send massive numbers of colonizers to set up new locations and acquire full physical control of another country. So a lot of it has to do with your, the word I'll use here is like acquiring force, your group of people, but that's just something to keep in the back of your mind because we are going to start moving into some new isms as things go on and I wanted to kind of wrap up the last couple of isms. We have a lot of isms in this chapter. This chapter could just be the chapter of the isms. This is nationalism, socialism, communism, capitalism, industrialism, uh, classical liberalism, conservatism, as well as probably another ism in there somewhere as well. Well, getting into it though, we're now moving into some major background of Latin America. The big thing we're going to be getting into right now, and so this background should have a little bit extra, background of Latin America and Latin American independence. So the native people of Latin America before Columbus ever got there were the Maya, the Aztec, the Inca. And like we talked about in class, the Maya was in very short numbers by this point. The Aztec and the Inca were the very heavy living, breathing native peoples of Latin America during the 1400s, late 1400s, early 1500s, upon Columbus's arrival. Then the European colonizers of their colonial era are going to be the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the French. Uh, lesser, and that's pretty much in order of force or territory that they acquiesced. So the big timeline of this whole thing, too, you got the English Revolution, the Glorious Revolution, which is going to come first, and that's going to lead to the Enlightenment. And this is all that direct cause and effect. The English Revolution and absolutism are going to lead to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is going to lead directly to the American Revolution. That's why we're not talking about North American. Well, we will, because Central America is still technically a part of North America. But we're not talking about North American independence movements right now due to the fact that they've already revolutionized themselves. North America, the United States, the bulk of it, of North America, is going to liberate itself from Great Britain in a revolution because they revolted against their government. Whereas, what the heck just happened? Oh my God, decline. Sorry, my buddy's calling me. Now, nope, all right. So, getting into it further though, the American Revolution is going to push the French Revolution. The French Revolution in coalition with the Napoleonic era is going to then lead to Latin American independence movements and self-determination in Europe. 
Now, you can also call self-determination nationalism as well. The process of self-determination is what we got into a little bit on the last unit, but this is, again, just another definition of it, if you need it. It's the process by which a country or cultural group determines its own statehood and forms its own allegiances and government. So the idea of self-determination, which is going to grow massively popular during this time period, is going to be forced heavily because there are too many ethnic groups and cultures and too few countries. So getting into it, granted the quadruple alliance in Europe that you all know as honors kids and my academics don't, the quadruple alliance is Great Britain, Austria, Russia, and Prussia. That's your biggest areas, and then you have France. But that's only five major countries, and there's over 20 different ethnic groups and cultural groups that exist within Europe. So you're talking about over 20 different languages, over 20 different uh, historical uh, delicacies. You're talking about over 20 different historical music like productions, art forms, a lot of different stuff. And here's a great map to give you an idea about why self-determination is going to happen in Europe. So this is what was left of the Holy Roman Empire following Napoleon's invasions after he turned it into what was known as the Confederation of the Rhine. Now, after the Confederation of the Rhine and Napoleon was exiled the second time, the Congress of Vienna is going to meet up and they're going to turn it into the German Confederation and they're going to take all those 90 plus principalities and they're going to whittle them down into 38 different ones with the biggest one being Prussia. This light purple, kind of mm, lavender periwinkle color, I would call it. Prussia Bradenburg is what it was called. So it's very, very large, but all of these people also speak German. That means you're telling me that that whole area outlined in red speaks German, but yet there is no Germany. So that's self-determination for you. This idea that at the lead, which we will talk about later under Otto von Bismarck and the Hohenzollern family and Kaiser Wilhelm I, they're going to lead a nationalism movement, a self-determination movement, and create modern-day Germany during the late 1800s. Specifically, 1871 is going to be the year that Germany finally formally becomes a country. This right here is self-determination in action in Latin America, which is what we're about to get into now. Again, do not be confused by the fact that I threw imperialism and colonialism up earlier. It's just something that you need to understand going forward, okay? Because now we're seeing the end of colonial rule, which is what led to the adoption of imperial rule or imperialism. So, colonialism's dying out, as you can see. This was the colonial empires of Latin America in 1800. You see the United States right here. In about 1803, Napoleon's going to sell this whole chunk of... Uh, that whole chunk of Spain or Spanish territory to uh, the United States and the Louisiana Purchase. But as of 1800, all that green was owned by Spain. And that was their colonial holdings. Those were their former colonies that started popping up in the 1500s. Then right here, the purple is going to be the Brazilians are, of course, the Portuguese colonies. And then you have a Dutch colony right there. And then you have French Guiana. And then you have the big one. This guy right here, the first one that we're going to talk about in this flip, we're talking about the French colony of Haiti. Now, you have to understand, though, Haiti, not its first name. Haiti is its name today. Haiti is going to be the very first self-determined country as colonialism begins to die and before the rise of imperialism. Remember, colonialism came first, imperialism comes later. I just want to go ahead and get this argument out of the way because I guarantee you I can think of at least one student right now that is going to be like, well, Mr. Terry, what's the difference between colonialism and imperialism? They sound like the same thing. And if that particular student thinks it's them and emails me, maybe I'll give the that particular student extra credit. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But anyway, French colonies, everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now, French colonies are going to mainly reside on the Isle of Hispaniola. Some of y'all are like, wait a minute, it says St. Domingue. What's going on, Mr. Terry? Something you gotta understand. Really quick, little sub-note somewhere. Looking at this map right here, that is Cuba, that is Jamaica, Honduras, coastal Honduras is right there. That's the DR, this is modern-day Haiti. This island that the Dominican Republic and Haiti share, and even shared during the 1800s, is known as the Isle of Hispaniola. H-I-S-P-A-N-O-L-A. 
the Isle of Hispaniola, divided heavily by a very mountainous region, a very mountainous region right here in the center area. To this day, a lot of people from the DR do not really get along with Haitians, and even during this time period, people from Saint Domingue and San Saint Domenico are going to not get along with each other because that's the thing is it wasn't called Haiti at first. Haiti was its name that was adopted after they revolutionized themselves, after they had a self-determination movement, after they had a nationalism movement and created the modern day country of Haiti. But originally it was a French colony known as Saint Domingue. All right. And I don't speak French, so I probably just really jack that word up. So it's going to be fine though. But just so you know, the reason why everybody wanted Saint Domingue is due to the fact that it was a sugar processing hub. Also, it was a major hub of the triangle trade. So it was a huge plantation economy area. One out of every three slaves that moved through the triangular trade network or the globalized European marketplace that was going on back at, right about now, which remember, we don't like to say triangle trade because it's a little too elementary school for y'all. We like to say that global economic network because you could go backwards and forwards. You didn't have to go step one to two to three to four to five. Like you didn't have to do all that. So something you got to understand though is one out of every three slaves traded in this network ended up in Haiti at one given time or another before then being shipped or moved to other areas. The population of Haiti still does have colonial holders, but it's six to one slave to free persons. That is crazy. And the reason why France was so determined to hang on to this colony for as long as they could is because 40%, 40% of the world's processed sugar coming, like during this time period, was coming from that colony, Saint Domingue, and 60% of its coffee. So you're talking about a major money producer, an outrageous money producer. That is why France wanted to keep hold of it. And some of y'all know uh, Haitian, people of Haitian heritage pretty well. There are a lot of famous athletes that are actually derived, or that have actually born or once lived in Haiti. And this right here, for example, is an uh, NFL wide receiver, former NFL wide receiver, he's now retired, uh, is Pierre Garçon. And as you can tell, French language and culture has carried over through Haiti because the man's name is Pierre Garçon, all right? And he was an NFL wide receiver. Just to give you some understanding also of this colony in total, it has an entire history of slave upheaval. Before the French Revolution ever even began, there were major problems with slave upheaval. Uh, there were a lot of slave revolts, and slaves began running away from their plantations at very, very, very high rates. A lot of this is due to the fact that anybody with two brain cells rubbed together could realize that the African American or the African descendant slaves that existed on the Isle of Hispaniola, the colony of Saint Domingue, heavily outnumbered the white overseers and landowners that lived there. So ever since like 1758, there were major slave revolts, a lot of violence, and a lot of other crazy stuff going on in the colony of Saint Domingue, right? Slaves would even establish, because they couldn't get anywhere, it's a colony, it's an island, they would establish these things called maroons. And where would they go? They would create these maroons, not the color, but these colonies, in the mountains that separated the, the Saint, Saint, Saint Domenico and Saint Domingue from one another. That little crooked little like line right there, those mountain ranges that separate the current day DR and Haiti from one another, they would run off into the mountains and start these little tiny colonies. Well, this was getting so bad at one point that it was heavily damaging the economy of this colony, leading to lower sugar production and lower coffee production. So what they're going to do is one of the most screwed up and bad decisions that they could have ever made in the colony's history. And what pretty much led directly to them wanting to liberate themselves was that the French government then allowed people of color, free blacks, all right, is what they were referred to as, and mulattoes, which were people, of course, of mixed race, which both of these things are historical definitions. They are not terms you use in everyday life. They gave them the right to vote and to own slaves, which is a very, very intense thing. The guy that even led this thing at one point, we'll talk about him in a second. His name was Toussaint L'Ouverture. He actually even owned slaves, which was a very, very wild thing. Now, Free African descendant people and mulattoes gained the right to vote and to own their own slaves in the national, oh, like from the evolving National Assembly, not necessarily the National Assembly, but from the French government at the time. 
This is going to create more problems, though, because then it's set up a social class system as such. It's a very funny little thing that actually ended up happening. Not funny like haha, funny like odd. There were a, about 20,000 free, like, free black people that lived in Haiti, all right? Free African descendant people. Most of the time, they usually did have some type of white uh, heritage of some type. They were on par with these people known as Grand Blancs, or wealthy white planners, which there were about 10,000 of them. So they doubled them in population two to one. But then there's a huge number of these people known as Petite Blancs, which are white laborers, shopkeepers, store owners, overseers of plantations, and the slaves. And then you have down here your slave population, that of 90% of the population, 500,000 of them. So this is really, really dangerous because you're setting up a lot of internal strife. These people, the Petit Blancs, began to hate the free blacks a lot of the times. And they did this, or they hated them because these African descendant people were making more money than they were, owned more land than they did, and actually could vote when some of these people could not. So it set up a massive, massive strife between these white laborers and these free people of African descent. And that's going to lead to another huge slave revolt in Haiti driven by those free African descendant people. Because they're sitting there saying to themselves, why do I have to worry about having arguments, fights, and disputes with these colonizers, these French people, when I was born here, and this is a Haiti that I want to be its, or this is a Saint-Domingue, which I wanted to be its own country. So when the French Revolution broke out in 1789, another slave revolt erupts in what you would call now modern-day Haiti, or Saint-Domingue, all right? I can understand that this name thing is very confusing, but we'll review it a little bit in your warm-up that's coming up soon, okay? So I'll talk to you guys later, okay? Go ahead and get this thing done before Tuesday. Your warm-up will mostly be outlining all of this different stuff. But I'll see you guys then. Y'all have a good one.